Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good morning, yes. Okay, it's my pleasure to I can hear you. greet you all this morning. Uh, we are sorry for um, the mm -hmm. slight delay in the start. We had some few technical challenges, but we've been able to sort them out now. And uh, we'll be starting the program in exactly two minutes. So kindly call your colleagues to join and tell them that we are ready and we'll be starting in exactly two minutes. Thank you. Who is there? I, I cannot identify. Hello. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You are all welcome to the Accra Technical Investing Library second webinar series and virtual training on trends on academic writing and publishing. By the end of this webinar, it is envisaged that the trainees will be well informed and educated on the ethical use of information and ways of managing research projects using the Mendeley Reference Manager. I am Evelyn Ago and your MC for today. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Without hesitation, I call Mr. Edmund Ananga, a library staff, to give the opening prayer. Shall we have a short prayer before the commencement of the program? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, this morning, once again, we say big thank you to you. We magnify your name. We glorify you for how far you brought us. It's not by our might. It's not by our power. It's by your grace. We thank you as you brought us here to work. We are here once again to do this program. As you are Alpha and Omega, we are starting in your name. We invite your Holy Spirit to be with us. I commit all the speakers, the moderator, and the hosts, our librarian, into your hands. Lord, all that we are going to do, we pray that it will yield a positive result. We thank you for the initiative. We pray that it will help this institution to grow and the library to change for the better. We invite you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Edmond Ananga. Moving on, I'll introduce our moderator for the day. I'll read a short profile of our moderator. Our moderator for the day is currently an associate professor in the electrical engineering department of Accra Technical University. He is a seasoned engineer who, who holds a PhD in energy systems engineering and has authored a number of publications in international journals. He is the recipient of many local and international awards. Our moderator for today's virtual training is no other person than our own Professor Amevi Akakobi, the able acting vice chancellor of Accra Technical University. Professor Akakobi is also a, a member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineer 
and a member of Institution of Engineering and Technology, Ghana. Moderator, you are most welcome to this virtual program. Okay, thank you very much for this powerful introduction. Uh, let me make a correction before you continue. I am not the acting vice chancellor, I'm the acting pro vice chancellor. Sorry, Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> Please, good morning, colleagues. Um, greeting to everyone. The Vice Chancellor is here, perhaps in line with us. I know he'll be joining us. Academic um, colleagues from academic board, um, lecturers, and even students present in this program. Please, uh, you are warmly welcome to this program. This is our second series uh, webinar. Uh, coming from the library of Accra Technical University. We did the first one earlier on the role of the library in supporting academic works. And today we are here again and we want to discuss another topic. I am very happy and let me express this happiness to see that we are here in our number. If nothing at all, I can read about 77 participants at this very beginning. And I want to congratulate us all for making it to be here to listen to these very important topics. Let me give a brief introduction by saying that the coronavirus has affected us to some extent and that has changed education in many ways. Many educational institutions try to respond to this system in different ways and Accra Technical University was not an exception. We developed a lot of measures to ensure safety of our students to ensure continuity of our academic you know, activities, that is learning and teaching. And we also find, we chart our part in actually um, conducting examination for students. And as I speak, we have finished all examinations. And without much ado, we have also done great efforts to bring the library you know, to the doorsteps of everyone. It is my pleasure that uh, to inform you that the library is making tremendous efforts to really make ATU library look like a world class, first class standard library. And this is actually the vision of the new university library and Dr. Plucky in line with us here. So you have the time to speak to us uh, mostly about some of these things. However, what are we doing today? If I look at again, the role of the library, which is mainly to support academic work in teaching in learning, in reading, in having access to information and all that, one of the key milestones we shouldn't forget is about bringing quality assured documentation or research outputs. And for us to have quality research documents, we need actually to avoid some of the mistakes that we find ourselves doing easily if attention is not brought to us. This is the reason why today we dedicated it to talk about plagiarism. We want to talk about plagiarism. There are so many definitions to plagiarism and the speakers will make justice to that. However, I must say that plagiarism may happen recklessly and unintentionally. And for that matter, we need to know a lot of tips about plagiarism. Recently, Accra Technical University has acquired the Tenetin software and which is going to help us to actually avoid a lot of copied work and a lot of plagiarism. This is going to apply to student and then similarly to lecturers. Students, especially those in final years, will soon be invited to be submitting their project work through the Tenetin software to determine copy and plagiarism. Whilst on the other side, lecturers may enjoy this platform for their academic publications. So this brings a lot of interest and I can tell you this is the best and the right time to talk about plagiarism. We have an expert from the University of Cape Coast who, is, who has much experience in the area and who will take us through a very long and detailed training on the tips of plagiarism today. I'm very glad to be part of this program as well. This will be my short introduction to the program now. We shall take a 30 second break and we'll be back with the introduction of the speakers. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much. We are back from our 30 second break and the number of participants keep booming. We have now 85 participants. Thank you very much for your interest. We shall have today two speakers. The first speaker, the first speaker is uh, the university librarian of the University of Education of Winneba. We have in our midst, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Viscount Buenote Boy, who is here with us. He will take us basically through the plagiarism and he will give it about, we will give him about one hour to really do justice to the topic. And we shall ask our question and have all the nitty gritty, you know, answered. And after him, we shall listen to a quick presentation on the Mendeley software, which is also used for referencing. And for the Mendeley software, we have Mr. Eric Amwafol, who is the head of Population and Social Science Library at the University of Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen, we are glad to have in our midst university librarians from very two top universities in Ghana. That is the University of Education of Winneba and that of University of Ghana. So thank you very much for listening to the presenters. At this point, we shall now call the first presenter to take us through the plagiarism. Mr. Viscount Buenote, if you're on panel, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. I'm happy. You are welcome, that, my brother. <laughs> I'm happy that you've invited me today to make a presentation on the uh, ethical use of information, precisely plagiarism, yes. which is a problem in our country. It affects not only students, but academics as well as politicians. But very often, it is the issue of politicians that um, is discussed. Today, I will take you through the definition of uh, plagiarism, what it is, and then uh, precisely how to get um, rid of what plagiarism is in our life. I'm going to use a slide prepared from a university in the UK, the um, University of Sheffield, 13th best in UK and the 75th best in the world. But the, 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 the information is from the Department of Information Studies, that is the high school, which is ranked as the best in, in Europe for several years. And I think uh, the second in the world. <clears throat> so I've told you that the, the slides are not mine. They are from a source. So I, I don't want to be accused of uh, plagiarism at the end of the work. <laughs> now, <laughs> my, my name is Viscount Bibwe, uh, often pronounced as Viscount, but uh, the name is Viscount. Oh, when you say Viscount, okay. it sounds sexy. So say Viscount. Viscount. Okay. Yes, it sounds romantic. I want it to be called <laughs> Viscount. Okay, let's go on. Uh, introduction. Maybe can you um, put the presentation in slide mode? Uh, in presentation mode, yes, so yes, that yes, yes. they can read better. Yes. Yes. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Then, um, purpose of the tutorial. Probably I need to also say that uh, I labor at the University of um, Education, Winneba, as the university librarian. And so uh, I'm using their time to reach you. I <laughs> guess teaching you is like teaching the um, part of our students here because your students will also contribute towards the development of our... We have hit 100 participants. Congratulations to all of you. I think Mr. Mr. Viscount is off. I think he must be having some technical challenges. Let's 
wait for him in one or two minutes. I'm sure he'll get back. Please, can we call him? Can you hear me? I'm having some hitches here. We can hear you. We can hear you now. So then I will explain what. But we cannot see the presentation again. Oh, my goodness. Yes, light. All right, it's clear now. Okay, all right, okay. Okay, so I will look at the meaning of plagiarism, then uh, differences between collaboration and collusion, and how to improve academic writing so that uh, we are able to express ourselves confidently in our writing, using our own ways and not anybody's ways at, at all. Okay, then objectives. By taking this tutorial, one will be able to demonstrate an understanding of plagiarism and how it can occur intentionally or unintentionally intentionally in academic way. We will also see the difference between collaboration and collusion. We know how to quote, paraphrase, summarize other people's words correctly, and then uh, identify ways of avoiding plagiarism through using appropriate note-taking and time management. Lastly, we will describe consequences of using unfair means in a on unfair means in assessment. Okay. Now, introduction. We we'll look at definitions of plagiarism, self plagiarism, and collusion. And then we we'll look at how to avoid it and adapt best practices in study skills and referencing. Okay. The Oxford Dictionary defines plagiarism as, quote, the action or practice of taking someone else's work, idea, etc and passing it off as one's own, literally theft. What it means is that if we use anybody's work and you pretend the work is yours by not crediting the source, that means you have plagiarized. Work here means written work. It means even oral work. Could mean images, etc., etc. Okay, the, a particular idea or piece of writing or design, etc., which has been plagiarized, an act or product of what plagiary. Now, the American Psychological Association 2020 defines it simply as plagiarism. Quote: Plagiarism is um, the act of presenting the words, ideas, or images of another as your own. So you see that it's just like uh, the one given by the dictionary. So this one is from American Psychological Association, page 254. Then, definition of plagiarism. This one is very, very comprehensive. From University of Sheffield, 2013, it said, plagiarism, either intentional or unintentional, is the using of ideas or work of another person, including experts and fellow or former students, and submitted them as your own. It means if you use somebody's work, if you're a lecturer and you use even your student's work or your colleague's work and present as your own, then uh, you fall foul of the uh, plagiarism. In the same way, a student cannot use his fellow student's own or his a former student's own, what we call grandfather. We don't do that. If you do that, it means you have what? Plagiarized. It is considered dishonest and unprofessional. Plagiarism may take the form of what? Cutting and pasting, which some of us do. Taking or closely paraphrasing ideas, passages, sections, sentences, paragraphs, drawings, graphs, and other graphical 
material from books, articles, internet, internet sites, or any other source and submitted them for assessment without appropriate acknowledgement. So for the Sheffield University, this is a definition of what plagiarism. The other definition is very, very comprehensive. And uh, I will urge you to know, look at it critically and then uh, go by that because it's very, very uh, embracing. It tells about images, words, et cetera, et cetera, that are not yours. You have to acknowledge them. Then plagiarism, the basic principle on aligning the preparation of any piece of work, of any piece of work, of any piece of academic work is that the work submitted must be your original work. In addition to the examples given above, work can be defined as data, statistics, tables, calculations, pictures, diagrams, charts, plans, maps, computerized data, computerized printout, ideas gained through group work, an essay or a poem layout. So this is the definition of what work by Sheffield University. See that it's comprehensive. So if you are doing a work and you take somebody's picture from a work that the person has done, you have to credit the source. If you look critically, BBC and other international bodies, when they show some images, you say that the, image, uh, the, the footage will come, get the images, showing that they did not take the images themselves, but they got it from uh, Getty, uh -huh, which is a, a, a company. No, so it is still plagiarism, whether you intended to plagiarize or not. Ignorance of the law, ignorance is no excuse, is no defense. So you cannot say that, oh, I didn't know it's plagiarism, and I did it. So you must know that what plagiarism is as a student so that uh, we avoid it. Because when you are caught, you can still be punished. Honestly speaking, if you, you plagiarize out of ignorance, your professor or your lecturer will know. And the punishment that the university will prescribe for you may be, uh, not be as um, the one that intentionally plagiarized. Forms of plagiarism. One, copy from published or unpublished sources without giving due acknowledgement, whether intentionally or otherwise. So if you copy from sources and you don't give credit to the person who put the work there, whether intentionally or not intentionally, it means you have what? Plagiarized. So this should guide us that in our essays that we write, our 10 papers, and even when we are teaching, and then we come out with some ideas, we need to acknowledge what the source, that this idea is not mine. Um, there was a time there was an issue in Ghana, and then uh, some professors made comments on them. And then the comments that they made were not their ideas, but ideas from two other professors. And that was about uh, this uh, Gandhi um, statue at the University of uh, Ghana, where they would tell you Gandhi was uh, uh, no, um, a racist, Gandhi was that, blah, 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 blah. The idea was done by two authors in South Africa. Desai and uh, Vahid, 2015. So it was expected as persons in academia, since they did not do this work, all that they will have to say is that, oh, according to these writers in these books, so and so, Gandhi was like that, Gandhi was like this. But they spoke to us as if they did their own research and they know primary research and they came out with that. These are the things that we have to what, avoid in what our writing. I keep telling students that um, if they listen carefully to Kwekubako, anytime he speaks, he, he comes out with some facts, he will quickly what, tell you what the source. This is how university students or we, people in academia must behave. They can't have a saying that Utu Mira, watch the SEA. I, I guess my account is right. 
paraphrasing from another source without correct acknowledgement and reference. And they, at times we will paraphrase the work all right. We acknowledge, we, are, we paraphrase the all right, but we don't provide acknowledgement and then reference. This creates an impression that is our 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 work and this constitutes what plagiarism. So paraphrasing or summary should be in your own ways to demonstrate your understanding of the original work. Laundering of other people's work, in other words, slightly um, altering or paraphrasing the original so that it appears as if it is yours, is called what? Um, it's also what plagiarism. It's also called patch writing, where you change words in a paragraph or a sentence to make it appear as what your own. It's also um, a form of what plagiarism. Then um, submitting someone's work as your own, including the purchase of essay, essays from creep sheets. This is an extremely serious offense as there is a clear intent to deceive the examiner. The university, a university may take an extremely serious view of any student who sells, offers to sell, or passes on their own access work to other students. This is very common in our country. This is very, very common. Students are given assignment, and then they will get some of this work that has been done previously, and then they will resubmit or they can employ somebody to write their work for them. The, 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 uh, thesis and dissertations, I'm told people are available who will receive money and then they intend they do this. These are all what forms of what plagiarism which we must avoid in our lives. Double submission, self-plagiarism, is resubmitting work that has been done before on one or more occasions without proper acknowledgement. This may take the form of what? Copying either the whole piece of work or part of it. Normally, credit will already have been given for this work. Okay. What they are saying is that self plagiarism is that you've done a work before and you are doing another work. What you are doing today is similar to what you've done before. You have to, if you're a student, for instance, you need to discuss this with your professor or your lecturer. I've done this work before, and I want to know, uh, yeah, use information from this to know. I want to build it up to meet this assignment. When the permission is given to you, in your work, you must state. You don't go about quoting yourself, so, so, and so, and so, and so. No, you just say, according to APA 2020, you just say that uh, I've, 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 I've previously discussed in an earlier publication or in an earlier assignment, so, 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 and so, and so, then you bring. You don't quote yourself, but you paraphrase and you show that this work has already been you know, done before. Um, in the same way, if you pro pro uh, there is a conference and then you present the paper, the conference paper is a conference paper. It means it's an um, article that has that is not complete. So later on, you may try to develop it, it into an article, journal article. You must this, make this known to the publisher, the journal, that I, you have already submitted this work as a conference paper. And you want to make it what, as a, what, a, a journal article. Once you do this and they agree, then you are uh, you, you are cleared. But if you don't do this and you go about to submit this as um, another work, it means you have what plagiarized. If I did a work in 2019, or let me say in 2019, uh, in 20, uh, in two, say 2012, I did a work in which in my presentation, 
I made some arguments that there was in the literature. They said university uh, librarians should be taught how to teach whilst they are in school. Why do I being trained as librarians? And I, I, I disagreed with uh, what you call it, that uh, proposition. And I came up with my own idea and I debunked it that no, teaching is a profession. Librarianship is a profession. There are some people who would like to be librarians, but they would not like to be teachers. Therefore, if you bring the two together, teaching and then um, librarianship together, you train them within a year or two, what the end product will be that you have half big teacher, half big what? Um, librarian. So the value media to this is that let the people do a course in librarianship. If they think they want to be teachers, they can do postgraduate um, diploma or certificate in teaching, then they become what? Teachers. This has been published. If today I'm doing um, another work and I want to use the same um, ideas, then I have to cite myself, say, where 20 or 12. If I don't do that, it means I have what? Plagiarize. But in, in, interestingly enough, APA 2020 is saying that if the information from the previous one is just very scanty, then you can just cite it without even, I mean, uh, without uh, crediting your, your, uh, yourself. Okay. Then making up non existent references or fictitious experiment data is fabrication and it's regarded as fraudulent and dishonest. There are some people, they go to, um, they be given an assignment and they will conjure non existent references, articles that they didn't read. They will say they, they will create their own article, their own journal, and then they cite from them and then they present. Many years back, I was making a presentation and then somebody got up and said, Oh, when they were in school, that was what he was doing. He would do this, and then lecturers were no, he didn't know until one of his colleagues went and told them that this is what this guy was doing, and uh, he was punished for that. Mm. So we must avoid that. I was in court some time ago, not as a, um, a litigant, just to listen. Then the lawyers were making arguments, citing cases. What the judge said is that, look, let me take your. Uh, the, your your citations well because some of you could come to court and fabricate references authorities and then when he goes to you know set for them he will not go out, get them so these are the things that we have to avoid as students if you grow up with this it follows you wherever you go and even in your way not be honest in the u.s if you're a lawyer if you're a law student and then you plagiarize that is your age. You can never become a lawyer in the US. You see? Then what is collusion? Collusion is a form of plagiarism where two or more people work together to produce a piece of work or, or, or part of which is then submitted by each of them as their own individual work according to the uh, Oxford English Dictionary. So you have been given assignments, student A and student B and C, they met, group studies. Then they produce the work. Then each of them produce the work as their own. If you do that, it means you have what? Committed offense of what? Collusion. All that you have to do as students that you make discussions, you take your points, and then you write your um, essay independently. Asking someone else to compose the whole or part of any piece of work, of your work, is also a collusion. You are doing the work, you said, uh, my introduction is not good. My abstract is not good. Johnny, could you help me? Or Comfort, could you, could you help me? And Comfort or, or Johnny, does this thing for you, it means that you have colluded. There is a, a, um, another form of plagiarism, which is in the university. 
involving class class um, captains or class leaders, as they may be called. They are tasked to collect assignments from um, their colleagues. And those who are smart, they know the smart ones among them. After collecting the assignments, they just look at their work. Those who are good, and then they just copy and then they will present as what they are own. Eventually, they may end up getting very good class. But they, in, in reality, they do not support merit research class. They just copy. In very good universities, students are not allowed to collect assignments from their fellow students. What is done is that when you finish your, 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 your work, you submit your work to your departmental secretary, and then receipt is issued to you. You are allowed, as student, to, when you finish your work, give it to your friend to go through, it's allowed, but not to copy. In the final submission, you submit it to your departmental secretary, but not through, um, not, 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 not to your, your class captain. Okay. Then copying the whole or part of someone else's work with their knowledge and consents. There are some supervisors when they are supervising some people's work, they say, Oh, I've done this while in my thesis, so so and so. Then they pass it on to them, oh, you can copy this. Somebody has written his essay, he's giving somebody, copy this. This is a form of pollution. In the US, there was a case of a professor who supervised somebody's PhD. And then uh, he made certain things from his own thesis available to the students. And he graduated as a PhD holder. Two years later, it was discovered, and his PhD was taken away from him. So these are some of the things that we need to uh, take into consideration when we are supervising students. Yours is to um, make the students have the formation. The students must write the formation in their own language and then credit the source. Allowing another student to copy your work, knowing that it will be presented as a student's own is a form of what? Collusion. Working with one or more students on an assignment together, you produce an agreed piece of work and then copy it for each individual submission. You need to be very clear from the, your lecturer on acceptable limit of any group work and what collaboration. So you'll be given an assignment. The group work is encouraged. Then you, you format and then you produce the work. You must produce the work as an assignment, as a group work, and you must then you send to your lecturer. But if you produce the work as individuals, although the work was collectively done, then it means you are it's what collusion, and then uh, you must be punished for that. So what if group work, for instance, what some people do, you do introduction, somebody will do the um, abstract, another person will do some part of the main essay, somebody will do uh, what do you call it, um, um, conclusion, somebody will prepare the relevancy, somebody will do the literature. That's it, then you all come together so that you all own the work. And if you own the work, it means none of you can go and publish this work as their own. It must be collectively what? Published. If you are a group of five and you do the work and then you sneak to get it published in your name, then you have plagiarized. If you become a professor through this, the person has the right to file a complaint against you and your professorship will be taken away from you. Hmm. What is not collusion? We've looked at collusion, but now we're going to look at what is not collusion. Collusion does not occur where students involved in group work are encouraged to work together to produce a single piece of work as part of the assessment. So when you are asked to do the work together, then it's not what collu uh, collusion. You do it and you are presented in the name of the group. Plagiarism and collusion are forms of cheating, like breaches in examination rules, 
impersonating another candidate and falsifying data are academic what offenses. So plagiarism and uh, collusion are forms of what cheating. Group work versus collusion. So how are you supposed to know where group work ends and collu uh, collusion begins? You are actively encouraged to work together with other students and discuss what you have learned together. Group work allows the sharing of ideas and information to complete a task. So it can be very difficult to be sure you are not what? Colluding. I hope this one is understood. Okay. Group work versus collusion, we continue. To avoid collusion, first you must ensure that each member of the group writes up their own assignment using their own words. So we have, we've had a discussion. For instance, we discuss, say, um, the factors that led to um, the defeat of uh, Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump in the 2020 elections, for instance, we discuss. We have about say ten factors. <laughs> Each of us will go and put all these fa uh, factors in their own words. Ways that is what group work. That is individual work. But where we all come together and put it in one language, and then we we submit as individuals. It means it's a it's what collusion. So let be clear where one starts and the other one what ends. Mm -hmm. Do not allow, do not allow others to copy your work. Allowing your work to be copied makes you just as guilty of plagiarism as the students who does the copy and just as liable to what penalty. To penalty. Mm -hmm. I thought you will do your work and it's copied. You are aware. You pretend you are not aware. And then when you are busted, you say, well, I did my work and I put it on my table, I left, blah, 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 and then it has been taken. No. Your work must be kept like your money. Secure. Don't make your work available. If you give it to somebody to read, you are there after reading, and he makes, I mean, uh, probably a comment, you take it, I mean, you take it, and that's all. Don't allow anybody to copy your work for you. If you are, if you are, a student who is good, you may have a friend, be the person male or female, it's your, your responsibility probably to bring the person up, but not to share your um, your work with the person. If you do that, the two of you may lose your certificates in future. Examples of acceptable collaboration. collaboration. Discussing both individual and group assessments with other students in the subject and then writing up your own assessment in your own ways is acceptable. You all discuss, then you do the assignment in your own ways. Then referencing group work and results to acknowledge the ways and ideas of what others. So in the work that you present after the discussion, then you must reference them. That with this group A, B, C, I mean, people, I mean, uh, if the group has a name, then you must give them that name. Or must say simply that a group that you belong to, we discuss this, and then they are properly acknowledged. Examples of unacceptable collusion. Engaging in detailed discussion as to written details of another student's assessment. Detailed discussions. If you do that, it means it's collusion, and it's not what acceptable. Then using notes, drafts, or completed assessment prepared by another student or another person without appropriate referencing, it means you have fought, plagiarized, is collusion. Then allowing your work to be copied by another student, we've said it already. If you do that, the person can even be your son, your daughter, your boyfriend, uh, your girlfriend, your wife, your husband. If you do that, it means you have fallen foul of what? Plagiarism. Examples of unacceptable collusion. A group has assigned separate tasks to each member, and one member asks another to do their share, and not to tell anyone because 
the marks are divided in the end based on the quality of the contribution of each. It will be acceptable to work together if you were struggling with uh, the giving piece of work. Talk to your supervisor if you are struggling with the way with the giving piece of work. Here he's saying you have been given a group work to do. Each of you, probably the group leader will assign a role to each of you. The one person says, Oh, I cannot do it, you just do it for me. And then uh, after all, in the end, we all get the same marks. The person is aiming to get there, his first class. He may ignore you and then go about and do this thing and then add your name to, to it. They are telling us that uh, it is an offense. You don't have to do this. I have this experience um, when I was schooling in Sheffield. We we're giving a group work. And there was one guy, anytime we met, he would not be there. So when we finished, there was a uh, proposition or suggestion that uh, we should add his name. Then I objected. I said, no, once he didn't do it, we shouldn't add his name. So I argued that somebody supported me, and then uh, his name was deleted. And then in our submission, we made a, a point, a, a note, that that guy was never present throughout. What the lecturer told us was that if we had added his name, it would be very wonderful. <laughs> and that, that will mean that uh, we plagiarize. Because, um, because in all other group assignments, given in which they, that guy was a member, all the groups reported that he wasn't what uh, present. How come that like, in our, our case alone was present? Not doing the guy left school and was in that thing. Uh, he was in the uh, Italy, look working. So these are some of the things that we have to. Integrity is very high. If the person is even your girlfriend or close relative or boyfriend, it is not taking part in the um, in the work get him off a professor told me of a story that when he was doing his phd there were five in the class and then they were given assignments no they were five um in a group they were given assignments and then when they finish the professor everybody contributed the professor marked the work but none of them had the same i mean each person had a different uh, mark. They protested. They said, look, I know all of you and what you can write. You, you wrote this section. You know so? said, yes. You analyze. You did this, you did this, you did this. And based upon this, this is how I mark you. So at times, you could do group work, but as you may meet a, a, a lecturer, a professor, who is very, very, very savvy, will tell you that no, he will not give you equal marks because he will know the contribution that each of you may put into the work. Then group work joins up with another group. You are giving um, group work. Then one group joins another with the same ass uh, assessment and agrees to share all the information, put in practice half the, uh, the group work. When assignment is given to you in a class, probably you have uh, about four or five group work each of you is to do. But group A does part, and then group B also does part, and then you bring them together to be whole. That is also what plagiarism. Then group finds a very good book in the library, which provides them with most of the answers to the problem they are required to answer. This is very interesting. A lot of us are guilty of that. They borrow the book from the library and place requests on it so that no other group can get hold of it before the assessment is due. The book is good, it's only one. So my group, we are say five. I will go for the group for the book, and then another person in the group will place a, an order record that as soon as I finish, it should come to him. He also goes for it. Another person also plays an order. So it means some other group will not have access to the book. 
this is very, very simple. Those of you who believe in sin, I will say this is an academic sin. You don't have to do that. The book is available, is in the library. Every student should do uh, should work. So in a group, if you go for the for the book, you read or take photocopies of the relevant pages, you leave it so that some other people will also what do. So we must avoid doing that. Then the member in the group never contributes to the group assessment assessment, knowing that the mark will be the same for every member of the group based on the final product. And other members are working hard to achieve is also unacceptable. I have heard of a case, the university I've not mentioned. When a group work was given, there was one person who was rich, had a car, and say it would tell them, oh, you people should be working. I'm going to find you some, some uh, food. He would go restaurant and then buy food. We we'll drink, then he will bring to them. They eat and work and work. He will not even be there. In the long run, his name will be added. This is a clear case of what plagiarism. We must avoid these things in life. That person today is uh, could be a big person somewhere. And one thing that I will tell you that when people plagiarize as students and they become lecturers or they begin to work, they begin to work, they are never honest in their work. They do a lot of silly things in their work because they lack integrity. So if you avoid plagiarism, you know that if you do this thing is evil, then even you in your workplace, you be very cautious in all things that you do. You become highly ethical. Drawing guidelines for collaboration. It is beneficial for groups to agree on a clear guidelines for collaboration at the start of the work so the the, the group leader will have to draw a guideline this can include keeping of minutes of all meet, uh, meetings there must be a secretary who will keep the minutes who is present what you did and agreeing on the consequences of it so you set up a room if somebody doesn't come what do we do to that person then in keeping the personal log of research academic communication and work completed so all this is must be kept and must guide you in your group work you don't just go and then um, sit down and then do it but it must be something that you got guide you I wonder if you can see. If you can enlarge. It's, it's, I mean, okay. it's not too visible, though, but we can read. Yes, okay. Now, we want to find out why students plagiarize. Mm -hmm. Yes. One, it said that they want to get better grade. This is a work done by um, somebody. At the end of it, I will, I will tell you. Person said, 59% of them said they want to get better grade. Therefore, they what? They plagiarize. Then 54% said laziness or bad time management make them plagiarize. This bad time management, at times, the fault is not the students, but the fault is from the lecturers. You give assignment within a week, Somebody is giving about two, three, four assignments to present within a week. Obviously, the person will not be able to do all this. So he had to what plagiarize to meet the deadline. The way out is that at the beginning of the semester, the lecturer, you know your your what you are uh, what you teach. So beginning, as soon as they register, the assignment should be given to them. Deadline should be given to the students. Say school reopening, say January. He said 30th March, 2 p.m. Submit your assignments. An assignment must be submitted at the departmental uh, the, the department to the departmental secretary straight away. So if you give them, say January, for instance, in say two weeks' time, somebody can present their work. Whether you've taught that um, um, topic 
that course or not, somebody can present because they are expected to read on their own to do their their their, their, their assignment. So let's help students to plan, manage their time very well by giving them enough time to do the assignment, and this can help them to avoid plagiarism. I'm not saying that if you are giving um, so many assignments at a given time, go and plagiarize. Please no, that's not the issue. There's no excuse for that. Then planning. Okay, then uh, easy access to material via the internet. Some people said that they have easy access um, from the internet. Forty percent of them. So because of that, they are able to what to um, plagiarize. Then twenty nine percent said they do not understand the rules of what plagiarism. Therefore, they just do things anyhow. And then they are busted as what plagiarists. Twenty nine percent, another twenty nine percent said that uh, it happens unconsciously. They don't know that they are what plagiarists. Then they said to avoid all these things. When you get a slice, you get to know how to know avoid some of these things. There's no we don't have much time, so I, I didn't want to explain some other things or read other things to you. This is a work done by uh, Newstead, 1996. Individual differences in students cheating. Available on Journal of Educational Psychology. I think this one is even open access, 20, published in 2013. 2013. I mean, um, yes, um, published in 1996, it's available. I think it's open access. When you Google, you get the full thing. Um, on the, on the internet. So these are some of the reasons why students uh, um, plagiarize. So additionally, some may also think it's not in the work that their, their lecturers do not have enough time to find out whether somebody has plagiarized or not. So they will do it. They will also argue that lecturers themselves plagiarize, so they will not take it serious. They don't have the skills to find out whether they have plagiarized. So these are some of the reasons why students would plagiarize. Now, paraphrasing. To write an academic piece of work, you need to consider the topic of your essay or dissertation. Read around your subject and organize your ideas into a coherent, concise argument. Additionally, at postgraduate level, you need to demonstrate through literature review how your research builds on and how it has developed from other previous work. Paraphrasing, you need to reference each of your sources. Every time you include an idea or argument from other reading. So when you paraphrase, the idea is not yours. It's somebody's knowledge that you paraphrase. So you must credit the person. Say, um, ATU students are smart, according to Akako V 2020. You provide it. But if I if I read Akaku uh, Akaku V's work 2020, and then uh, he says that the ATU students are smart, and I said ATU students are smart, then I do not credit uh, Akaku V. It means I've plagiarized. And then my lecturer women ask me, "How did you get this information?" You understand? So the source from where I got it. I must what provide it. Okay. Source materials, if you use effectively, will lend credibility and authority to your writing. Provide opposing views against which you can comment or align the force of your arguments. You should not include a citation without offering an explanation of how the source supports your conclusion. You don't go about quoting or providing sources when there is no link between that and the work that you are doing. You are doing some work, then uh, you bring something like a, a quote from, say, um, Shakespeare. All the world is a stage. All the men and women merely players. They have the exit, their entrances. Unquote. Okay. How does this relate to what the work that you are doing? Or as I tell my students, just like saying that uh, your wife is bereaved, is not the father or the mother. Then that is the occasion you go and read the person. Uh, some sweet ways. 
do you think it can impact on the woman meaningfully? No. She's bereaved, thinking about the father that she has lost. You need to console the person. You need to find certain ways to make her uh, overcome her grief. Yeah, 144 now. I'm uh, sorry. I was so that's it. If you quote, your quote must relate to the idea that you what you 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 express. Okay. Paraphrasing does not mean just changing a few words. You're just changing a word here or there, or even sentence or two. If the paraphrasing, if the phrasing of the original is evident, the phrase should be clearly should be a re statement of the meaning of the original word. So when you read, you sit down and you write the idea in your own ways. Then you provide the source. Akakovi 2020. Expressing ideas in your own ways indicates to your lecturer or your supervisor or the editor that your level of understanding of the original material. Avoid using too many direct quotations in your essay as it can detract from what coherence coherence of your argument. So don't use so many quotations. If you do that, it means you are not even thinking. Just quote, 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 no. Few quotes, you paraphrase some of them, and then uh, you bring your own ideas. When you quote, you don't just quote, but you must express uh, your understanding or your view on the quotation that uh, you will express. Expressing ideas in your own words indicates to your lecturer, yes. Uh, paraphrasing brings in more easily with your own line of reasoning. It allows you to express your understanding of another idea, another, an, another's idea and comment on a particular aspect. So avoid using quotes that have only tenuous link to your work. Yes, as I told you, you don't quote something that has very weak or no relationship with the work that you are doing. You are you are you are doing something on say uh, mechanics, then you are quoting Shakespeare to support it, which you know is not acceptable. Okay. Then when to quote rather than paraphrase. Okay, so you need to quote the text of any formal definition or standard to ensure the exact meaning is conveyed to your reader. There may be a turn of phrase or expression used that is particularly significant that could not be conveyed by paraphrasing. There are certain words that you cannot paraphrase them. So when you cannot paraphrase them, you just have to put them in quotes to show that they are not what your words. You got them from uh, some other places. They can be just one or two, but still you can just put them in quotes. When to quote rather than paraphrase, there are several ways to integrate quotations in your text. A short quotation works best when it is embedded into a sentence areas rather than what long ones. So um, quotations should be sh should be short. If you take this popular saying of uh, Shakespeare, "All the world is a stage." All the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in this time plays many parts. The act win in seven stages. First, the infant, mewing, the pupil, the nurses. It's long. So what people say is that all the world is a stage. All the men and women merely players. Short. It covers all everything. So this is how we have to go about our quotations. Okay, reporting ways. When paraphrasing, you need to summarize the key points of what you have read in your own words, in your work. Reporting words, verbs are useful to evaluate, represent, and write about other authors' work, their claims, findings, conclusions, cases, etc. For example, so you can start like say, John argues that, Akakovi argues that, Kroke intimates, blocky demonstrates. These are the way that we have to go about when we are report, when we are paraphrasing. Then good and bad paraphrasing. 
remain mouth product race successfully and to avoid plagiarism, you must do all three of the following. One, restate the information and ideas from the source, whether print or electronic, accurately. Two, use your own language and style, not the original authors. You can include key phrases from original if you identify those phrases or words or phrases by quotation word max. Okay. Then, um, so in a mere phrase alone can be what? Um, can be plagiarized work. There was, there was a president of Ghana who had uh, addressed uh, UN. And in the in the speech, the president appeared to the, he talked about the problems of the youth in Africa, where they may start some business because of difficulties, they may even sell the business, poultry farm, maybe their buildings, and then trek through the, uh, the desert, Sahara Desert, to Europe. Some of them die on the way. And uh, he made an appeal, passionate appeal to the world body to help um, Africans to do better their lives in Africa. Then he used the same phrase. He said, if they, they do not, then this was going to be like um, a scar on the conscience of what? The world body. Scar on the conscience of people is a coinage by Tony Blair of um, former Prime Minister of what? Um, UK. And the person, our president, was addressing UN. And since that phrase was a conduit from uh, Tony, which was well known, the best thing for the person to have said was, as Tony put it, scar on the conscience of what? The world body. If he did, I think people would have saluted him for doing that. Doing that. But it went unnoticed. Up to now, I don't think many people know that that person plagiarized. You understand? Okay. Acknowledge the original author, source of the paraphrase material by citing them in the text and including them in your list of word references. So you do the acknowledgement in your essay itself, it has in text citations. Then at the end of the work, you provide what the references. So if you cite in the course of the work, we call it in-text citation. Then at the end of the work, where in-text citation means the author and then the date of publication. And then uh, if you quote in the page number from where the quotation was taken, this constitutes in-text word citation. Then at the end of the work, the journal or the book in which these things, this formation was taken becomes what your reference because you refer to them in, the, in, in your in your work. Okay, this one uh, I will not let us go through this. It's a, like an exercise. Time is not on your side. I was told, so skip this. When you get the slide, you can work these things out yourself. Uh, what is paraphrase? What is on a uh, good good paraphrase? And what is on good paraphrase? Like you can do this yourself. There are some exercises here. You go through them. Then effective note taking. Make sure that in your notes you recall details about the material you will need to include in your reference. So when you are doing, when you are doing work, have a notebook so that whatever article or piece of work that you do quickly you write everything most often students will come to you as a librarian and say i've done this work and then the, the lecturer said that you bring the references so it's when i was doing i forgot and it, it will become our task to find this out i remember many years ago when i was in kumasi somebody brought me a certain woman who was doing her MBA at KNUST. She submitted her work and she couldn't provide references to the in-text citations. 
and the deadline was due. The supervisor said, you should do it. I don't know how she got to know me. Then she came to me that this was her problem. So if I could assist her, they said, how much will I charge her? I said, no, I don't do that. It's unethical. Though you are not a student, but you are a student of another university, I could still help you. Then throughout the night when I'm sure she was asleep, I did the work for her. I could not only get two of the references and I asked her to delete those things from, from, from my work. But later on, I got to know that uh, the work was actually done by somebody for her and uh, the person didn't take pains to know write down where the references were, you know, were, were, were taken from. So you as a student, please get a dedicated notebook. Once you use the information, write the author, the year of publication, the title of the work. Um, if it's a journal, the journal, and then uh, the, the publisher, if it's a book, that's all. Now with APA 2020, yes, uh, author, date, title of the uh, book, then publisher. Or if there is an edition statement, then you write edition statement, say ninth edition. Then you write, say Pearson. We don't write uh, the place or the city of publication again. APA 2020 has made it so simple. So you just write the publisher, but not the place of what publication. Then they said, put quotation marks around any direct quotes or highlight them in different colors, even if it's only three or what, four ways. So if the book is your own and you have, you have highlighter, then you can highlight them in the book. But if it's, not, it's a library book, you, don't, you dare not do that. And then if you even rewrite the words, it said even if it's only three or four words that you've taken and they are not your own, make sure that you you, you write them in a way that you get to know that these are not your own words, so that when you are paraphrasing, you find a way of writing them. Paraphrasing, paraf, paraphrase correctly, remember, remembering to be precise. Separate out your own ideas. Reflect on what you have read and what it, it relates to your topic or question. Use abbreviations, in my humble opinion, in the margin, that is in your private work, not in the essay. In my humble opinion, it means your own opinion, so that you don't forget that opinion. As soon as you remember, as if you have an opinion, you write it in my humble opinion as a note in the margin, or highlight them in a different color to be clear that it's your own reflection on what you have read. This one will not do it, but it's a very good one. When the slides come, you can go through yourself and then you, you understand. Yes, there is what we call common knowledge. So common knowledge can be classified as anything that is generally known or knowledge of recent facts or events that has to become so common that it has lost its original um, pertinence. Um, we said whatever information that we use, we must what acknowledge. But there are some information that when we use, there's no need for us to what acknowledge. And this kind of formation is what we call what common what knowledge. That Ghana gained independence in 1957, six March, is common knowledge. If you write this thing, there's no need for it to be what? To be cited. That Nkrumah was the first president of Ghana, or he led us to gain independence, is what? Common knowledge. There's no need for us to cite that Shakespeare wrote as you like it, or Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet is common knowledge. There's no need for us to cite. However, if you take a quote from Shakespeare, like the, as you like it, for instance, if you take a quote from as you like it, that's one of the books written by uh, Shakespeare. Uh, I wish I could remember some, 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 something from uh, that book. Okay, this uh, will be what I've told you early on. Um, 
all the world is a stage, all the men and women merely plays. I've taken it from, uh, quoted it from Shakespeare. Once I quoted from Shakespeare, then I must provide a source as what? Shakespeare. You understand? You see, Shakespeare in As You Like It. And because it's a quote, I must show the page number or the, that it is taken from. That is how uh, it is done. Now, if I quote from, if I say the constitution of the fourth Republican constitution of Ghana gives me the right, eh, to, gives me uh, what you call the freedom of what, uh, movement, freedom of speech, there's no need for me to provide what in the source. What I've mentioned, the, um, I've mentioned um, um, that the fourth Republican constitution of Ghana. So anybody who reads or hears me can go and what find out. However, if I could, you understand? If I could verbatim from the constitution, then I must provide what the source, the page, the article, the clause, and everything that is taken from. I hope this is clear. Okay. Just the same thing like the Bible. The Bible says, "Don't kill." It's okay. But if, if I quote verbatim, it means I must provide the source. The Bible said, oh, when you are in need, we should ask or we should find. It's okay. But if I said, uh, uh, I wonder if I can even quote it. <laughs> you said, ask and shall be given. Seek and it shall find. Uh, knock and it shall be opened. It's a quotation. And therefore, I you tell you, it's Matthew 7, 7. I hope I'm right. That is how it is done. So in the academic work, this is how we must go about it. Common knowledge, there's no need for us. So when the common knowledge, if the work is recent, like the US elections, now, it's common knowledge that um, Hello, Mr. Vipont. Hello. Ah. Uh, we are enjoying your presentation, but we want to prompt you about our time. <laughs> time, okay. I'll, 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 I'll we'll finish with this wrapping one. Up, so. the Thank you. One. Like the U, UN um, election is very current. So you say something like uh, Biden has won election, for instance. There's no need to provide any source. However, if, you, if there is a discussion that is not in open, and that you know that there is a, a, some other factors that led to his winning this um, election that is not known, then you must provide the source from where you got that information from to know to support your, your, yours. Then, so, uh, okay, I think I've explained this since already. Uh, so that is common knowledge within a discipline is more difficult to determine. Uh, if you are in the first year, your common knowledge will be different from somebody who is you are in first year. If you are in the first year in a university, within geography, for instance, your common things that are common knowledge will be different from things that uh, when you are reading PhD, that you become what common knowledge. Okay, this subject has its own rules, and uh, that covers it. So, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want to leave on borrowed time. My time is up. And then uh, I will end here by saying that uh, so far, I've been able to demonstrate an understanding to you of what plagiarism is and how it occurs intentionally or unintentionally in the work that we do as uh, students or academics. Then uh, also, I've been able to demonstrate to you the difference between collaboration and collusion. And then, then quote, paraphrase, and summarize other people's work. And then identify ways of what avoiding plagiarism through appropriate notes taking and then what time management. This is a very comprehensive one. And um, I'll give you the slide. I'm sure there'll be somebody in your university who can have um, in person um, tutorials with you and then take you through how to do practicals, how to avoid. Uh, how to write your paraphrase and how to cite the sources. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity.
to make this thank visit. you thank you thank you uh we are not meeting physically other we are seeing people applauding for you <laughs> but we are doing it online thank you very very much for this great and insightful presentation on plagiarism i think we've learned a lot uh, participant i want to assure you that uh, we shall have a session for question and answers for now you can still be putting your questions on the in the in the, in the question box and we are picking them there so we'll read them when you reach the question and answer sessions so that uh, mr viscount will, will actually address most of them uh, i also want to uh, <clears throat> uh, congratulate you for your times i think we've keeping with times uh, in no time now we shall end this program but uh, at this juncture allow me to invite the second presenter uh, this is mr eric amwafo from the university of ghana legon he is to take us briefly through uh, Mendeley, uh, Mendeley software. We shall give him a maximum of 30 minutes, and after him, we shall have a session for question and answers. So please uh, stay with us. Uh, Mr. Mwafo, can we have you uh, to start your presentation now? Mr. Mwafo. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Yes, Prof, you can have me. So I'll start. <laughs> uh, if you want to share a slide, no problem. You can just... Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, so I will need the right to do so. Yeah. Okay, Let's, we will assign the right to you shortly. I think you have it already. Just share your screen. You should be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, so I'm sharing. Just a moment. Are the screen is visible? Yes, it's visible now. Okay. All right. Good morning once again, and thank you all. Good morning for being online most often by the time you are an hour through a lot may have dropped out but i can see the participation is increasing Thank that's you. great <laughs> okay so my job here is to take us through uh, how to use the mendeley reference manager my name is eric amponsa Mwafo, and i work with the university of ghana specifically as the population and social science library which serves the Institute of Statistical and Social Research and the Regional Population, Regional Institute of Population Studies. Right. So per the time I have, we normally when I do this training practically for uh, listeners to be able to follow and use practically, it takes minimum of two hours. So what we are going to do now is to look at the benefits and what we can use Mendeley for so that those who get enticed will uh, try to your hands on it. It's a very simple to use software and I believe once you are eager to adopt, you can easily go ahead. Or if at a later date there's plan to have a practical session, we can also do that. The least I'm able to do with this is mostly two hours, and that's even at a very fast pace. Okay. So, as the earlier presenter has already said, Mendeley falls in line with some of the academic tools, innovative tools that as a researcher and a student, you can adopt to be able to stay away from plagiarizing. I say this because once you are prone to the manual ways of doing things, for instance, you can be writing and because you may not have a book or an article with you, instead of citing at once, you may postpone that. After maybe copying the content and pasting in your work, you may postpone the citation, probably because you left the source in the library or you forgot to take the bibliographic details you needed to cite. By the time you realize you have forgotten and then you didn't go back and the work is due for submission. And then as Mr. Boynotte said, 
before long, in a year or later years, you may be found out and be caught of plagiarism. So Mendeley is a very innovative tool that I urge everyone to give us a brief of their time to see how best they can adapt to use it for a more innovative means of researching. So I said Mendeley, as you can see on the screen, is owned by Elsevier, and Elsevier is, uh, as we know, one of the leading um, research resource vendors in the world. They are the owners of Scopus, Science Direct, and many of the electronic resources that we use, and they have procured Mendeley. So it's a Mendeley helps you to discover new research by suggesting new and related articles to you. It advances academic social network and promotes research visibility. We'll get into how you get to do that. Now, traditionally, this is how you see uh, as, you know, researching. Somebody may say that, okay, for me, um, I prefer to do it manually. I read and then I can see it physically and type. Uh, I find it difficult using the computer to do these things. Now, the challenge here is that once you do that, you may read all right and type your work all right. But assuming you have a project and you need to travel, and whilst there, you also want to do some bit on your work. Are you going to carry all these articles and books with you? And if you read and annotate, as you can see from the image below, are you able to also um, remember where you did all these annotations at a glance? That mostly is very difficult. So we are saying get innovative, adopt some of these research uh, management tools and just with a system. So what you can see here with this chart on your screen is basically a very innovative researcher who only needs an electronic device. It could be a tablet, it could be a laptop. So what this means or what Mendeley helps you do is that it takes away device dependency in your research. In that regard, we're saying that you don't need to carry even your laptop all around the world, wherever you need to go to carry on with your work. Because once you adopt this tool and use it, wherever you find yourself, your resources are with you because it gives you the chance to store all your research content in the cloud. Meaning that wherever you find yourself, once you are able to log in into a system, it need not be yours. Once you log into a system and then download and install Mendeley on that system, the system automatically gives you access to all your research articles that you use to write. And if you have a cloud version of your project, then you are able to continue. Your work does not get delayed just because you left your office desk or your home office. Now, what are some of the benefits you get to have? So it say helps you to automatically generate your bibliographics. Now, those who write, you agree with me that uh, generating your bibliographic or reference list alone can take a lot of time and it's one of the headache of a lot of our graduate students. Even those of us trained in the field, sometimes it becomes difficult to remember where the punctuations are. And within the various referencing styles, if you pick MLA or you pick Harvard and AP, sometimes after the title is a comma, some is a colon. Some, you go straight. How are you able to remember all these? We are saying that using and adopting these innovative tools takes away that stress from you. By the time you hit your last full stop, your bibliographic reference list is generated for you to submit your project work. And for instance, for our lecturers, I, there was an instance, um, one PhD candidate here called and his problem was that he had submitted an article to a journal. And because University of Ghana uses APA, he did his reference in APA, but then the journal says he should convert them to um, Harvard. Now, his pain was that he was visiting my office so I helped him with how to reconfigure all the references. When he came, I just asked, did you use the tool? I took it through, he said yes, and I said, okay, log in. So all, just by the click of a button, we had switched from um, APA to Harvard. So those are some of the ease that comes your way when you adopt this tool. You are also able to collaborate easily with other researchers online. So if you are in a group project, instead of having to share all the resources that any of the group members come across, the system allows you to create a group. 
into which all collaborative team members are able to input the sources that they come across that is relevant to the project. And wherever any of the group members may be, they are also able to assess it and contribute their quota to the project. Yeah, it also allows you, so those who may probably be using other referencing softwares, the system allows you to import and export in between other uh, similar softwares. It allows you to find relevant papers based on what you are reading. So we all know how tedious searching for relevant articles and e-content are to a particular project. Now the system runs an algorithm that is able to suggest relevant articles to you even before you have asked for them. How does this happen? So once you create the account in Mendeley, you are asked to choose a field, your field of study. And periodically, as you search and add content to your account, the system is able to detect your area of interest. So anytime there's a new or related publication to the particular field or to the content in your account, the system suggests these to you and sends you a link either on your Mendeley interface or and also to your email. So what it means is that you are even told of what is good for you even before you have thought of it or even before you have found it. You're also able to access your papers from anywhere and everywhere. So meaning that your work does not get delayed just because you left your default machine. Uh, I'm sure there are some technical challenges. I'm not too sure whether you can still hear him, but let's give him some one minute and see. I'm sure uh, it will be solved. Uh, Miss Eric, Miss Eric, can you hear us? We, we are unable to hear you. Please call him. Call him on the line. Let's see. Mm. Call him. Okay, we are waiting for Mr. Eric to join us back. But Mr. 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 Bueno, are you there? Okay, hello, Prof. I hope I'm you, are, you are back. I went off shortly, but uh, okay. we can hear you okay. loud play now. I don't know why. Okay, you I hope the sound is also good. The sound is good. Okay. Okay. okay, okay. All right, sir. All right. Oh, um, yeah, we can. Oh, yeah. See. We can see. Okay. Um. So let me get back. To where I was. I was saying you can. Uh, excuse me, just a moment. All right. All right. So I say the system it gives you a free. Probably if this way we were, we were. Hello, bro. Hello. We can listen to you. Everything is clear. Okay, so um, as I was saying, the system also gives you an institutional edition which comes with a subscription. So if uh, ATU decides that they want to have all the features of the software, then it means that you have to subscribe to it. That gives you unlimited um, storage access and groups, the number of groups that you can create. So what that means is that, for instance, as a lecturer, you can create, it allows you to create a group into which you can post content that you want your student to use. You can, even areas you want them to read, you can put annotations there for them to easily find. And then we're saying this works on cross platform. So you have all the operating systems that you can use. And then it also works with all other browsers. 
Now, how does Mendeley help or how does it work? So what you see here are your resources, let's say databases online, and then browsers that are used to assess them. What you see in the middle here is the um, cloud server of Elsevier into which all other contents that Mendeley users download uh, go. So as a user, once you create an account, the system gives you access to a storage space into which all your content go, which is why you are able to access them on your devices wherever you may go, meaning that the content that you upload are not just on your local machine, but they are also stored in the cloud for you. If you are using a free edition for free, only that your storage space is limited to two gigabytes. Now, how do you get to use it? So this is the default interface that greets you when you visit mendeley.com, www.mendeley.com. And then you click on create account to have your own uh, interface to work with. So now one thing I must alert, there may be others who are using the software as at now. Um, if you are not aware, Mendeley or Elsevier is upgrading the software. So what you see here is going to be the new interface that will greet you when you get to this site and they have added a search box here, meaning that even before you have logged in, you can search. And because the software is owned by Elsevier, once you search here, you are basically searching in Elsevier's content and also the Mendeley web catalog. Now, this is the old interface. You can see that it comes without the uh, search box. So once you click on create an account, this is the interface that greets you. You are expected to enter your email. Now, if you belong to an institution, it has its advice. So for instance, ATU, uh, faculty, staff, and students, it's advised that you use your institutional email. In that regard, they are able to identify you as an institution and also give you some tailor measured services. Once you sign in, as I said, they are trying to upgrade the software. So those who are using it, you realize that when you sign in, you don't see the old interface. So this is what you see is the online interface. When you sign in, you don't see the old one again. This is what you are going to see. And a few more features are going to be taken out. So this is how the older one looked like, just like a desktop, but this is how the new interface will look like. Or this is how it looks like because it started in September. So this, in September, this old interface uh, was taken down. Now, this is also, yeah, so this is the old interface. And so the system works with two interfaces, what they call the Mendeley desktop and then Mendeley web in the old balance. So the web meaning that when it gives you an interface that you're able to browse online, search for content, add them to your account and do other maneuvers in your cloud storage space. And then the desktop is the content that is housed on your local system that you're able to use to conduct your citing and writing. So this is technically the uh, new desktop library, which is just like the online one and then this is the old one so this is how it used to be so if we have about some five minutes i'll log into mine and show you how it was this is the old interface so currently i might put this across currently mendeley desktop is still working the mendeley reference manager which is a new one that's about taking off attention those who are using it already that is supposed to take off in december so in january you are going to have a new interface which is going to be like the Mendeley Reference Manager web interface. So whether online or desktop, you are going to have the same interface. So after December, this interface you see on your screen, those who are already on it, is going to be no more. And then, yes, yeah, so with that, it will be replaced with this interface, as you see. Great. But still, as the current, the Mendeley desktop is still working, so I'm going to take you through how the interface is. So, one of the essence or the tools that the system gives you is to help you to organize or group your resources. So, as you can see in the image on the screen, this is a researcher who probably 
I bought some books or borrowed a lot of materials in the library, some journal articles, some e-books, some magazines, and this is what is on your desk. How are you able to sort all these things? This is space you are wasting. So we're saying that the software helps you to organize these things by having the electronic versions of this content in your account, in which case you don't need to cloud your office desk and you also don't need to carry heavy materials around as you travel and need to work. So it enables you to add the relevant content into your account. And then it also enables you to synchronize your desktop interface to the cloud interface. The essence of that is that once you do that, what it means is that whatever you have on your desktop, so assuming I share the content, a common article with Prof on a pen drive, once he adds it into his account and synchronizes a copy of that article, relevant as it may be, is added onto his uh, cloud interface, meaning that wherever he may be on whichever device that he logs in, he can get access to that content. So those who are using it, I always advise that you keep syncing. So always remember to synchronize so that in December, so this is the synchronized button, this particular button here, that's a synchronized button. So please, if you're already using the package, try and be synchronizing frequently as you log in, in order that in December, when the new system take over, all your content will be in the cloud, so that once you download and install the new interface, you still have them back. So the system allows you to organize your materials, assuming, for instance, in my account, if I should, I have about uh, close to about 900 uh, ebooks and journal articles. Now, how are you able to find a particular one if you need them for a particular project? So the system allows you to create folders, for instance, to group your content. So once you do that, at any point, depending on the project, you are able to tell which uh, folder uh, carries a particular article and which project that that article is related to. You are also able to uh, sort by recently added content. Uh, the ones that you read recently, once you click, they will be sorted for you if there are particular articles that uh, you think are favorite to particular projects, you can also uh, highlight them as such. You can also add your own publications into this particular folder. So these are some of the tools that the system gives you. And once you have them, it means that they are accessible in Mendeley's web catalog for others to find and also uh, follow and cite you. The system also allows you to collaborate. How do you do that? By collaborating, it means that you are able to create groups and highlight content and share. So as you can see here, this is a particular um, content that the reader has highlighted. So once this article is shared or is uploaded into a group folder, meaning that all group members in the, on the particular project are able to assess this content, read and share their opinion as they deem fit. Uh, so that's the interface for creating a group. It, so mainly group is mostly private, meaning that uh, you are able to share full source content. You know, as um, we have uh, copyright issues, so you cannot just download content and be sharing among individuals who do not belong to your institution, who are not on a common project with you, else we are breaching the copyright rules. So Mendeley only allows you to share full source content on a closed group, so a lecturer, student, or lecturers, or researchers on a single project. So these are some of the annotations and highlighting that the system is able to allow you to do and share with your group. Citing and referencing. So the system allows you to integrate uh, some tools into Microsoft Word, which allows you to carry out with your citing and referencing. I will demonstrate that briefly once I'm done. It also allows you, as I mentioned, to generate your in-text citation. So as you're writing, you're inserting your citation outright. And that's one advice we always advocate. Do not write thinking that later I'll come back and input the citations. We say cite as you write. So by the time you hit your last full stop, your reference, your index and your reference list is already generated for submission. And the reference list is normally populated automatically. 
So what you see here, so there are instances where you may need to do multiple citation. Mostly these are the questions I get. The system allows you to do that. In an instance where you need to portray the group of authors or researchers who share a particular opinion that you're trying to portray, the system allows you to do that multiple citation. And then just by a click of a button, there's a sample of a reference list or bibliography that is populated. On the Mendeley web interface, we said it helps you to also search. So once you are online searching, instead of downloading content in onto your desktop before you add them, the system allows you to attract them straight away into your account online. Once you click on synchronize, the files are already in your account. So you don't need to cloud your interface by having some on your desktop, having some on your online account or downloading them before you can add them. So the tool that is used for doing that is what is known as the Mendeley Web Importer. So for instance, if you find yourself on Science Direct or Emerald, all you do is search and once you find an article that is useful to you, instead of downloading, you rather extract it into your Mendeley account online and straight away you have it to use. You are also able to uh, follow or create groups and find others who are in your research interest and follow them. Mendeley suggests, so this is the tool that suggests uh, related articles to you. And then one of the other tools is also Mendeley Data. I believe participants online are aware that uh, the push, the new push, not that new, is that um, to reduce the you know pressure and also the time spent in data collection, the, the advocacy ongoing is that researchers must make their research data, the raw data available once they prune and publish the output, meaning that as a researcher, you get to be cited for the research data that you collected once someone else finds it useful to use as uh, probably another study or to use part of it to find out uh, some trend in a particular research area. So you get cited for your data and you get cited for your research output as well. So Mendeley or Elsevier is making available what they mean, or uh, what is known as Mendeley data for you to be able to upload your data sources once you are done with your publication. Now, as I mentioned, uh, as at November, Mendeley announced that they are upgrading the system and some tools are going to be retired, as they put it. So this is a direct text from their website. And as you can see from this interface, these are some of the features that are being retired, meaning that they are no longer going to be available. So if you are someone who, are, who is using the software already, please take note and know what you intend to do before that. So as of December 2020, we'll begin retiring some Mendeley features and those features are what you see there. So Mendeley Profile. So Mendeley Profile is a feature currently that allows you to put out your uh, academic biography. So your details, your publications, where you work, all the information about you. And also Mendeley Feed, which normally gives you discourse into the research world and also into update into the software. So they're going to also retard that. And Mendeley Public Groups, which uh, allows an individual to search for. So Prof, for instance, who is an engineer, will be able to, if electrical engineering groups, there are so many groups available, so you can search for some and join. But currently, Mendeley is retiring that feature. And then one of my favorites, which I feel bad is going, is Mendeley Funding. But I believe El Sevilla will find a way to keep it. So Mendeley Funding is what you see currently on your screen is a feature that kind of um, gather um, funding opportunities, accumulate funding opportunities and make it available for researchers and students. So meaning that once you go there at every point, so this interface was captured just some, uh, whilst Mr. Boa was uh, presenting. So as at then, that was 20,034 uh, content. So please, my advice is that researchers and students online Please visit the interface currently is available. And if you can copy the funding opportunities that are available now and save them somewhere so that as and when you need them, you'll be able to visit and use them. Because by December, this feature is going down. They may rehash it in one of NSVS packages or it may not come back, but we need to have this list available. 
Uh, thank you. So, uh, Prof, I think I'll need about some five minutes just to take listeners through the desktop version as to briefly as to how they can uh, use that. That's if I have that five minutes with your permission. Yeah, we, 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 I think we, we, are, we are impressed with your presentation and the time you have actually used to deliver it. We'll give you five more minutes so that you take us through the demonstration. And I'm sure a lot of people are waiting. Okay to have that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So. Okay. So. So those who are already using the package, as you can see, this is what we mean by Mendeley desktop. So this is my desktop interface. Yes, as you can see. And uh, from here, you can see I have a lot of folders that I have used to group the various research areas of my interest. These are also some groups that I belong to. I've also used it to create uh, research method, you know, group which into which I have a lot of research method sources that I share with uh, students of interest. So you can also use it for that regard. And the current interface, if I need to also show that briefly, is this. So this is the interface that will be taken over after December. It's a bit similar, but you can see some of the tools are not available but when you talk of the folders and many other things the groups they are there the only group feature that's going away is the um, public groups so currently we still have the Mendeley desktop working so i want to briefly take us through how we can add content into our account so to do that you go to file and then you say add file so this is assuming you have some content in your articles on your desktop or you have them downloaded. So you briefly do this, um, come on, come on. Yeah, so you have this dialog box as we always do, you browse around to wherever you may have your articles located and then you upload your content. So if uh, assuming my articles are here, I'll click on them and then have them so you may know where they are so you click on them and then you have your content uploaded as you deem fit. So once you do that, so assuming that you've gone through those rudiments and you have your articles, so this is the content you're going to have. And for the citing, uh, let me have this basic demonstration, just one or two citation and then we'll move away. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. So, as in Microsoft Word, let me share my. Once in Microsoft Word, what you do is that you go, so once you connect the systems, you go into references, once you install the desktop and you integrate, you go to references, and then you can see insert citation. So I'm assuming that I intend to set, to insert a citation here. So let me cancel first. Be sure that your cursor is blinking where you intend for the citation to be. So if this is where I intend for it to be, you click on insert citation. And then if you know the author you want to search, you can type the name here, or you can also click on go to Mendeley, and then you can choose the author if this be the author. And then you can see this is site, you click on site. Just a second, you have your in text. Um, 
Great. So that's what we have. And then once you want your reference list, you only click to populate that only once. So let's assume I want my references to be here. So once I place my cursor there, I go to insert bibliography. And please, if you're not using it before, you click on insert bibliography only once. So once I've done this at the beginning, assuming I insert another citation here, so I go to insert references, click on go to Mendeley, assuming this is the author I want to cite, and I click on cite. So you can see that the second one has been inserted. Now what you see here is that this is the article I cited the first time, but then what I cited the second time has jumped to the top. So the system does not just populate the reference list for you, it also sorts them. And then by the reference style you choose. So which style am I? So if I come here and I choose APA, it automatically so you can see that it has changed from um, the previous one to APA. So just by the click of a button. So this is what I was talking about that assuming you sent an article to a journal and they ask that you change from let's say APA to Vancouver. All you need is a click of a button and you are there, no stress. So that's, that, that's it. And then everything is done for you. You can see that it's now using numbering instead of, so that's Vancouver for you. Mm. So thank you, Prof, we'll take the questions and then if in future we need to get thank in. You, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for very happy everyone. for your time and for your insightful presentation. We are very, very much happy, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for welcome, your time. Sir. We are still there. We are 140 participants now. Thank you very much for, for, for having your time with us this uh, morning. And I'm sure you have not regretted the, the amount of knowledge we acquired from the two presenters. We shall now move to the question and uh, answer sessions. And I expect it to be highly interactive. In fact, we will receive quite a number of questions. And I'm even at loss whether we can really address all of them. But forgive me if reading, <laughs> uh, I somehow maybe forget one or the other. The questions are many, which means that the presentations were very interesting. So, Mr. Buenote, please take some few questions uh, for, for the beginning. Okay. A lecturer here would like to find out what are the consequences if I fail to cite in text but do that in reference list. It means that I, I, fa I fail to cite in the text, but I bring I brought it in the reference list. What are the consequences? That's uh, the first question. Oh, okay. Can I answer? Yes, please. You can answer. Uh, it's still an offense. <laughs> it's, still, it's still an offense. Uh, it means that uh, you 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 must have used somebody's idea in the in text but you refused to um, credit the person, and therefore it becomes a plagiarized work. So we must always take note that you provide the reference, the in-tax citation, and then um, at the end of it, you provide the reference. Okay, thank you. Take another uh, question immediately. Okay. Uh, however, mm, okay. uh, at times you provide the in-tax citation, then you may ignore, probably forgot to bring the, um, the references. That I'm one sure is if you are using the software like the Mendeley that comes yeah. automatically. Oh, well, then that's <laughs> it. I'm looking at the other way around too. <laughs> and that's yeah, one why. I, I think that's one of the reasons why we should encourage the use of software now. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yes, that yes. some well, of these errors, when we are working manually, they come naturally. Mm -hmm. You, If you are manipulating more than 100 references, you may easily forget one or two if you are dealing with that manually. But the software takes care of that, so I think it should be encouraged. Okay, okay let's take a second question from a lecturer here, Mr. Bright Azuma. He wanted, he has a lot of questions in natural fact. What is the consequence? Uh, I, mean, I mean, what consequence? Uh, please, let me read carefully. What is the consequence faced by the institution that does not disclaim responsibility from the plagiarized work of an employee. 
It means an employee has plagiarized and the institution did not disclaim responsibility. Is there any if consequence? If they were published by the, uh, the institution and somebody at AP, a ATU published um, um, a journal article and it's found out to be plagiarized work. Yes. Uh, you cannot hold the, the, the university um, responsible because I may submit the article plagiarized. The university may not even know anything about it, but it affects the image of the university. And the person is your product. Uh, this is why we advise that you should get a tenant in. If you want to publish um, an article, mm. the manuscript you pass it through the tenant in to you know mm. to, to help you. Okay. So, it, it, to some extent, the, it has to also, let, let me add that it depends also on the policy of the investors. The policy, the investor can implement a policy such that if you put the name of the university in disrepute, you can be taken on disciplinary actions. And actually, plagiarizing and using the name of the institution turns out to be putting the name of the institution in disrepute to some extent. So we have to be careful about that. Like you say, we should publish in journal where at least we have a check of plagiarism using the tenetting software prior to even submitting so that we avoid such situation. Okay, it follows with another similar question. To what extent does a punishment for plagiarism take retrospective effect? To what extent does a punishment for plagiarism take retrospective effect? No, I think there's no time limit on, on it. So you may you may have had your first degree, second degree, terminal degree, probably you plagiarized. If today is discovered, it could be 10 years back, 20 years back, they can still fight you. So there's no time limit on it. I think that's a very great answer. And that we should all keep that in mind clearly. There's no time limit on it. It doesn't matter. As far as a claim can be substantiated with fact that you have plagiarized, the punishment takes effect, whether it is done 10 or 100 years ago. Okay. If a student plagiarizes a thesis, a thesis work, and gives unnoticed and goes unnoticed by the supervisor, is the supervisor also punished for endorsing the work? Uh, what I think, <laughs> um, <laughs> the normally is the students who would um, be punished. The supervisor, for instance, um, it, it, it would appear he didn't do his work very well, but he can also argue that you don't provide me with a tenant in. How do I know? You understand? Mm. At times, you read the student's work, instantly, you know that the person has plagiarized. At times, mm. you may not know. So if you want to hold the lecturer or supervisor responsible, they provide the supervisor with all these things so that uh, they're able to check the student first. Uh, in some universities, each student has got an account. When you finish your work, you pass it through the, uh, you check yourself first. And then when you clear yourself before you submit. Therefore, when you submit and then you are busted, it means that uh, you intentionally what? Plagiarized. Oh, I, I I like your answer, but I still believe that it, it has to do with institutional policies to some extent, because uh, I think there is a policy that bites the supervisors to some extent. They will be forced to check whether this the work submitted by their student is a plagiarized work or not. But I think for now in ATU we have acquired the Tenetin software, and it's going to be binding. So you can submit work if you don't pass it through the Tenetin. And that actually uh, deterred our responsibility from the supervisor. So yes. the student cannot submit if he doesn't meet a certain percentage. Okay, yes, uh, I'd like yes, to go yes, to yes, Mr. Eric yes, Amposa. Prof, can I add a bit to that? Okay. Prof, can I add a bit to what uh, you just said? Okay. Uh, so, so the onus rests squarely on the student. So, for instance, um, on Tenetin's own disclaimer, they say that Tenetin is not. It does not accuse anybody. It's not the final authority on whether a student or an author has plagiarized. Yes. So, for instance, Tenetin only works with documents that are online. 
So assuming I pick your thesis that is in the library, which is not online yet, and I quote from it, it will be difficult for a supervisor who is not exposed to that thesis to realize that. So the work may pass, even though it has gone through Tenetin, because the material is not online, it can hardly be detected. That is why the timeline, there's no timeline to whether a person plagiarized or not. As and when you are found, you can't be penalized for it. So it is up to the writer to ensure that whatever they put across, they have cited. That's why we advocate for cite as you write, cite immediately before you forget. Because whether it becomes intentional or unintentional, there's no excuse. Thank you. Thank you very much for, the, for shedding light. Let's take this. It's a bit long, but I think it's for you. My students are unhappy when I ask them to provide a citation for each paraphrase statement in their work. They have the habit of paraphrasing whole paragraphs in the work. This means if they are to provide a citation for each paraphrase statement, the in-text reference will appear rep repetitive in the same paragraph. I understand it is due to the questionable quality of their write-up, hence their unhappiness. Is this an acceptable practice? That is providing the in-text citation after paraphrasing a whole paragraph. Is that an acceptable practice? Yes. Over um, to you. To avoid plagiarism, whatever idea that you use, that is not yours. Idea, words, or images that you use, that is not yours. You have to what, provide. And therefore, mm -hmm. if you write a term essay or a paper, and then uh, you paraphrase, uh, you got information from say two or three paragraphs. You may have to provide all because they are not for your mind. But um, I guess it's not a matter of just providing mm. the uh, what do you call it um, the strategies alone. You can't go, go about paraphrasing, paraphrasing, paraphrasing. You must also show your own uh, opinion on the yes, issues that, that you have. Otherwise, you go about paraphrasing, quoting, paraphrasing, quoting. Where is your own your your, your own opinion? opinion. So students want to be taught that no matter the length, when you use the idea, provide the source, and that solves the problem. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Eric uh, Amponsa. Can you quickly take this question, please? What is the advantage of Mendeley over EndNote? And would you advise someone with EndNote to switch to Mendeley or to keep to his EndNote? Well, we all have different preferences. Someone likes Toyota, another likes Benz. So the two softwares are to help us with our academic writing. Now, the reason mostly for students, I advocate for uh, Mendeley is that for Mendeley, you don't need activation. So even though University of Ghana subscribe to it, all you need is your institutional email and it's activated. So even here, mostly, even though we have EndNote and we have Mendeley, we mostly give the Mendeley to students because wherever they find themselves, only with their email, they can activate it. And currently, it appears that two softwares are very close in terms of performance and the various things they do. But uh, I see Mendeley giving you the opportunity to store your content online, copies of them, full source content online is a plus right meanwhile there may be some features that allows one person to choose a end note over mendeley so normally i don't advise what we do is that we introduce and then participants choose what they think serves them best whatever instances where some have switched from mendeley to end note and some have also switched from end note to mendeley so if it serves your interest all we are saying is that these are tools that will help you do your write-up properly to abstain from plagiarism and also help you speed up your writing process. So once it serves your purpose, I think Thank you should go for whichever you. one it serves. Thank you very, very much. I think you have killed two birds with one stone because another question I was about to ask is that, is Mendeley download free? And the answer is there clear. It is free. You just need to have an institutional account and you can activate your own. Thank you. Now, we move to another question with Mr. Uh, uh, even with your, even with your uh, prof, please go ahead. 
even with your own private even with your own private email you can have a mendeley account okay. but we are saying that they have some specialized services that they can give you if you use your institutional account so if you belong to an institution it's better you use that instead of your private email thank you okay thanks for the clarification i think it's been very helpful okay so we will continue how can you disclaim responsibility of a plagiarist work you co-authored with a colleague without prior knowledge of the work being plagiarized it means that you've co-authored a work with a colleague but you discover later that the work was full of plagiarism how therefore can you disclaim responsibility that's a question mr no, 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 I'm, I'm sorry you cannot disclaim responsibility it's co-authored Yes. Therefore, it's expected that when uh, your colleague does their contribution, you must also, what do you call it, um, go through to find out whether it's good work or not. It means you agreed. Therefore, if you don't do all these things and then you publish and later on it's discovered, then uh, you must be held jointly responsible. You cannot exclude. I see. So I think the lesson is clear. We have to check before we publish. Yes. But once it's published, you share responsibility. I think the, the the only thing you can do is to agree and withdraw the paper if you if you think the, the plagiarism is high. But uh, there's nothing else you can do beyond that. Okay. So what do you say about this? In checking your plagiarism in a work, do you have to include or exclude your bibliography? Um, it depends on the policy of um, the, 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 the university. Some of them will tell you the, the uh, references should be taken out. Uh -huh. Some will just say the main, the main, the main, the main, the main work. Okay. It depends on the policy. Mm. Okay, let me just ask quickly. Do you run a policy on plagiarism? Prof, let me add a bit. Okay, go ahead. Let me add a bit to that. Uh, so already by default, so the institution that use Tenetin, Tenetin only allows configuration to exclude bibliography. So if you pass your work through Tenetin, it does not check the bibliography. But the assumption is that that is the credence you are giving to the contents you have used. So it automatically excludes excludes them per the configuration the administrators put to it. Per our last training on the Tenetin, I think the supervisor or the one who set the assignment has the, the 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 choice to exclude whether it should check the reference list or not so you can set that such that it doesn't yeah check. yeah exactly uh -huh. is mendeley an open source software is mendeley an open source software yes but they also have a, an institutional edition which gives you more advanced features okay that is great well we we are wrapping up i think we are making doing justice to a lot of uh, question but another question is here what is the punishment for plagiarism um, uh, um, it, uh, um it depends on the university but most often what they do if you're a student and you plagiarize they go, they go fail you, and then you resubmit the work. Uh -huh. okay. Two. What if you are a lecturer and if you if have if published if papers? If yes, it depends on the policy of the university. Okay. Yes, but most often they will sack you. But there are other instances where people plagiarize. Professors plagiarize. They are busted, but their no action is not taken against them. Because the university will be looking at its own image, <laughs> and then the contribution that these professors have been bringing to their their university. So if you go and do that, then uh, there will be um, the university itself will, will suffer. So what yeah. they will do is that they will keep you in the university, but they will not give you some responsibilities. You can never become a VC. You can never become a, a, a dean. You can never become a head of department. <laughs> any any you cannot take any key responsibility i think there are so many questions that if you continue we shall not finish and i see that people are dropping we are now 129 and we have far exceeded the time we have planned for this it's two hours in actual fact and i think we are we are 19 minutes past 12. i want to bring the question session to a close but i'll ask one question each of the presenter before we close this session 
And uh, in anticipation to the next presenter, I would like to ask Dr. Florence Plucky to prepare uh, to give his closing remark. Immediately, we ask the last two questions. Now, let's go straight forward to the question. One of the very dominant questions for which I shall provide an answer in my remark is that of the certificate of attendance. Kindly be patient to answer this question. However, uh, can we take this question to Mr. Uh, Buenote? How can I avoid self plagiarism? How can I avoid self plagiarism? This is okay. from Dr. Amisa. Yes. Okay. Self, self plagiarism is very simple to avoid. It, it simply means work that you have done before, you need to credit yourself that you have done it. If you publish an article, you can't really submit it to another uh, journal for publication. It is what? Self plagiarism. Now, if you want to take some information from the previous one that you plagiarize, then you must indicate that in the work that you do. If you publish um, a conference paper and now you want to use it as an article, you must keep the journal informed that this is this work has been published previously as a conference paper and I'm now I've did some revisions and I want to publish it as a, a I mean a journal article. That that's it. And for self-plagiarism, it simply means that all information that you have published before, credit yourself that you have done it before. Yes. Because if you express an opinion in say 2010, and you are expressing the same opinion today, and you don't credit yourself, it means you are creating a false impression mm -hmm. that that opinion is current. Meanwhile, you've expressed it 2010. Two, I see. some other people may have used that information before. And therefore, mm -hmm. if you credit yourself, it means that um, you are the person and not those other persons. Thank you. Okay, a last question for you. It's very important it's from a student. He says, sending my old piece of work to a friend to serve as a guideline for his or her current work. Is it a form of plagiarism? Maybe it's a sandal. Oh, we need to find it, out if that is a plagiarism. It doesn't become a plagiarism only if the person doesn't pick any information from the work. But it's a guide how to write introduction how to write abstracts, so and so, so and so. I mean, it doesn't make, um, uh, what do you call it? The person becomes plagiarized. But it's only when you pick something from that information and you incorporate that, that idea of information into yours. Without crediting the person, then it becomes a plagiarized work. Thank you very much, Mr. Bernote. Mr. Eric Camposa, we have a question here on the literature, yeah. literature search, literature search tool of Mendeley. Somebody okay. said that you could use the literature search to get a number of references, but you realize that anytime you get references through that means some of them, um, when cited, do not look complete or they don't have the requisite information. Sometimes you get just the name of the, 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 the article, sometimes you just get the, the author's name or something is missing. How standard and how, how really standard is the literature search tool of Mendeley? Hello. Okay, Hi. so uh, this is what happens. This is what, so sometimes, you know, the ebooks and journal articles that we have, they are packaging, the formatting, don't just follow our normal conversion of files from web to PDF. They have some specialized formatting that enables the softwares to sift information from them. Now, if this is not done properly, it becomes difficult sometimes for this to happen. I know, for instance, that. Um, JSTOR, it happens a lot with articles from JSTOR. So what you can do as a user, my screen is active. Fortunately, <coughs> I saw an example. So if you look at the, but this, at, is my screen still shared? No. It's not. Yes, yes. It's my screen? It's not shared, but we can give you one minute to do that. I'm sure we will not live here today. At okay, so let, let me just share, give you something briefly. Okay, so I believe it's shared now. Yes, we can see your screen now. Can, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, great. So this is, yes, so this is my library. These are my articles. Now, this particular one that is open, once you click on an article, what you see here are the bibliographic details of the article. Now, if you come to this one that is open, you can see that the year of publication, everything is not there. 
meaning that the software was unable to extract it automatically. If the article is that relevant to you, what you do is that you open it just like I have done. You can see the year is not there, but it is here. Then you click and type it in there. If the author's name is not there, you copy and paste them. So it helps you to, you can edit the bibliographic details. So that is one way you can go around it. Great, great, yeah, great. Thank, thank you. you very, very, very much. Uh, we are impressed by your delivery. We thank you very much, Mr. Abuenete and Mr. Eric Camposa. We'll stop here for questions now. And when we move to Dr. Florence Plucky, who is the university librarian of Accra Technical University. In fact, she is the innovator of all these programs. She initiated this series library program. We had the first series and we are having the second series now. And uh, we commend her initiatives. We would like to give her the floor to say some few words. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. I'm very grateful. <laughs> Um, I'm not taking your closing remark from you, but just to share a few words, <laughs> I should say. <laughs> I think it's an honor to be among such a great accomplished individuals and also to participate in today's uh, exciting conversations. At ATU Library, we started this webinar series to create a platform to share this and very insightful topics with the university community and beyond. All this is to encourage members of the university community to effectively use our library resources. I hope and trust you have learned something today, and this is going to enhance our academic writing engagement, or to become a lifelong learners and also to avoid plagiarism and also to make referencing very easy for us in our various publication writing. I'm very grateful to everyone. We have somebody who's going to give books of thanks, but let me just say a big thank you to Mr. Buenote and Eric and to all participants who have waited so long. Uh, our goal is to make this a regular series, as you said, and so please be expecting our next uh, invitation or announcement very, very, very soon. Our doors are also open for any suggestions on these library related topics. Thank you all for having you. We are grateful. Thank you very much. Paul. Dr. Plucky, thank you. Thank you very much for your short speech. Uh, I'm very grateful that you are conscious of the time <laughs> and then the duration of the program. Thank you very much. Um, at this juncture, we shall have a final remark from me. Oh, and I, for oh, me, I'm also mind. very glad to share some few words. Accra Technical University in this fourth industrial revolution times have developed for ourselves an academic philosophy, which I can summarize is looking at uh, forming independent thinkers. I say independent thinkers. And I repeat the third time, independent thinkers who have comprehensive knowledge of ICT, you know, leadership and also entrepreneurship. Now, when we are talking of people with independent mind, we cannot afford to train them with a mechanism that allows copying, collusion, and other forms of plagiarism that actually kill the independent thinking spirit. And this is why we bring this program to you so that we can awake. Those of us who are still sleeping and doing the wrong thing, maybe our sin are forgiven as much as uh, they have not been exposed. But going for forward, Let's do our best to catch up with the right tools and do the right thing. Also, let's don't leave aside the issue of referencing because we see projects were being downloaded here, being copied or sometimes paying people to do it. All this must stop. We also want to take uh, advantage of this opportunity to, to commend some of the efforts of the library. Uh, recently, the library is getting closer and closer to us. They have installed the COHA system which allows us access online. And very soon, we shall have access to library resources online, wherever you find ourselves, uh, just that we need, we need internet access. So the final point I'd like to address is the issue of certificate. We receive a number of comments uh, asking us whether we shall deliver a certificate of participation. Unfortunately, I must be frank that we didn't plan this. But uh, it's coming at a point where I realize that uh, people have valued the presentation that has been delivered and the reason why they demanded that. We are working hard to incorporate this in our next series. 
and uh, we shall put that immediately in the advert. Participation shall go with a certificate. In the meantime, keep sending emails to the university library email that are put in the message box so that we can have your names and the email address and be able to send all the presentation to you. We shall consider the issue of certification for our next series, which shall be announced very soon. On this note, I'll stop and I'll hand over to the MC to continue with the rest of the program, which I believe will come to a close in the next five minutes. Please, over to you, Ms. Evelyn Tewia. Thank you, Prof. Akakuvi. We thank you so much. Indeed, this has been a very insightful training session. And up next, I'll call upon Ms. Esther Asantejima to give us the vote of thanks. I do it great honor and privilege to be called upon to give votes of thanks. First of all, I give thanks to the Almighty God for such a resounding success in our virtual training. Secondly, I thank the management of ATU, Accra Technical University, for giving us opportunity to host this virtual training. Again, we give special thanks to the speakers Mr. Viscount Bueno Tebue, University of Education, Winneba, the University Librarian, for such a special talk. We also give thanks to Mr. Eric Amponsa Amwafo, University of Ghana, Legon, for such a special talk. Again, we give thanks to the moderator which is um, Mr. Professor Amevi Akapovi of ATU, Accra Technical University, Pro VC. We thank you so much. You've always been our backbone. Thank you so much. We are grateful. We also thank our university librarian, Dr. Florence Plucky, for allowing herself to be used. Thank you so much, Madam. And all thanks also goes to the entire library staff for also helping for their hard work. Thank you so much. We are grateful. We are also grateful to all the participants. Wherever they are, we will say thank you and God bless you all. Thank you sorry, very much for your participation. Thank you. God bless you. Just as we began with God, who has brought us to an expected end, I'll call, without hesitation, I'll call Mr. Albert Menuteria to give us the closing prayer. Let's pray. We pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, we thank you for this afternoon. We thank you for our lives and that of our facilitators and the listeners. We started this training with you and we are closing with you. We thank you for making this training a successful one. We pray that we would put into practice all we have learned and also what we have learned will serve as catalysts for development in our lives in our societies and in our institution and Ghana as large. For this and other intentions, we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord, who reigns with the Holy Spirit in unity, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen indeed. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.